going to talk about the process of transformation. Well, what is transformation? It's changing everyday things like our transformer truck or cells like our bacteria guy into something new, right? We're giving it new powers, new abilities. The first question is, well, what kind of cells can we transform? Um, there are two different types of cells we can transform. We can transform eukaryotic cells, but they're a little complicated. The other kind of cells that we can transform are prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria are smaller, they have a cell wall, they have a cell membrane, and they have DNA that is not inside of a nucleus that makes them a little bit easier to transform. Well, how do we transform? Well, if you think about our cells, like a machine or a chef, right, the chef can make whatever recipes come along the line, right? Whatever recipe he gets, he'll make a different product. Our cells can make lots of different protein products as well. We just have to give them the instructions. Well, what kind of instructions are there? Well, the instructions are housed in molecules called DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA exists as a double helix, and it's double-stranded. However, in bacteria, DNA actually exists as a circular chromosome, and in a lot of cases, plasmids. What are plasmids? Well, plasmids are small little chunks of DNA that are used to carry all sorts of useful information. For us, they're a tool that allows us to produce different genes and different proteins of interest. For our lab experiments, we're gonna start off with two individual plasmids. They each have parts of interest that we want. On this plasmid here, we have our red fluorescent protein and our promoter sequence. On the other plasmid, we have our origin of replication, our ampicillin resistance, and our RSC gene. Now, our goal is to actually get several of these pieces together to create an ultimate plasmid, one that contains all of the things you see here. Now, this process isn't perfect. Sometimes we get errors where we end up getting certain pieces that we don't want, such as various ampicillin resistance belonging in other places, or even the construction of it may tie it up in knots. If we do get the plasmid we want, how do we insert the plasmid? We want to insert it back into our cells, into our prokaryotes. In this lab, we're using E. coli as our prokaryote of choice, and now we need to figure out how do we get this plasmid in. You'll notice there are some barriers. There's a cell wall blocking the way, and also the cell membrane. Right, this can't get in without passing those two things. There are two specific problems with the plasmid getting in. One of them is actually size. Right, the plasmid is way big compared to the holes in the membrane. It can't get through. Right, so the pores are too small. And the other is charge. The membrane is negative and the plasmid is negative. So then they actually will like, repel each other and the plasmid won't want to go inside of the cell. Well, the way to solve these problems is we take our membrane and we actually treat it with calcium chloride. So the calcium chloride will come in and be attracted to the phosphate groups that are negative, and that will help neutralize this charge. Right. Once the charge is neutralized, these things no longer repel. We do have a problem, though, that the plasmids don't necessarily fit in the little gaps you see in between each of the phospholipids. So let's zoom into the membrane now. OK, so bacterial cells also, in addition to the cell wall, have a cell membrane. So we want to get our plasmid inside of a prokaryotic cell. Well, not only does a prokaryotic cell have a cell wall, prokaryotic cells also have cell membranes. And cell membranes are phospholipid bilayers. They consist of two layers of phospholipids. And phospholipids have a hydrophilic head and a hydro, two hydrophobic tails. And this can cause challenges for plasmids that we need to get inside of our cell. After we've neutralized the charge of the phospholipids, we also have to worry about how do they actually get past the small little gaps in between each of the phospholipids. Well, when we store these cells, after we busted open the cell wall, we store them on ice because the cells have the ability to repair the damage to the cell wall. Well, when there's a cold temperature, that means there's not a lot of energy. So these phospholipids tend to be very firm. And we see that the plasmid will not actually be able to pass through. It kind of bounces off the phospholipids and stays out. But what we're going to do is called a heat shock, where we're going to add energy by heating up the cells. When we do this, that causes these phospholipids to bounce. 
and the more they bounce, the bigger the holes get, and these plasmids can sneak on through into the inside of the cell. Now we've transformed our bacteria. So our plasmid is now inside of our bacteria. We took this prokaryote with no plasmid and transformed it into this one. Now the plasmid's inside. So our regular bacteria is now a super bacteria. It's making all kinds of protein products. One of the protein products we're interested in is this RFP, that red fluorescent protein. But is that the only superpower it has? I don't think so. Maybe it has a few more superpowers. What do you think? One of the great things about plasmids is it allows us to not only select for the protein of interest, but we can also include ways of getting just the cells we want in particular. If you look at our original um, plasmid here, we have our red fluorescent protein, but we also have this ampicillin resistance. What that allows us to do is have these cells resist ampicillin, which kills normal bacterial cells. So by having that ampicillin resistance, we can take our superbugs and have them survive a situation where we grow them in ampicillin. This is really important for selection methods, and this is what we actually use to select the bacteria that have our plasmid of interest. Now we want to make a lot of this red fluorescent protein. Right? Our goal is to produce this product. So now we have to grow the bacteria that have the superpower. So how do we grow bacteria? Well, one way to grow bacteria is to grow them on plates. Right. These may just look like circles, but they represent plastic dishes called petri dishes that we can fill with different medium or food. Luria broth is bacteria's food of choice. This is like a big buffet for our E. coli. So that has only food and things they like. The second one is LB or Luria broth plus ampicillin which is where we actually add the antibiotic into the plate to select for the bacteria that we want. The third one has the LB plus the ampicillin plus arabinose, something that will help us kind of kickstart growing that red fluorescent protein. So the question is, when we plate our new super bacteria, what do you think will happen? Take a moment and make a prediction. What do you think will grow on each of these plates? <laughs>